You've booked a trip to Argentina. You've always wanted to go. It's on your bucket list, but you don't know where to go to Argentina. Mm, wait, let's go back. Argentina? Where even is that? What is it even known for? Argentina, a country located in South America. Argentina. But maybe you know it as this, or this, or this. But have you seen this? Or this? Ever since the 19th century, elites within Latin America and the Caribbean region have sought to homogenize their national populations through a process called blanqueamiento. Blanqueamiento, also known as whitening, occurred through the promotion of European migration, bringing thousands of Europeans all the way to South America into the early 20th century. Other Latin American governments had always wanted to whiten their respective areas through immigration. However, Argentina came to be the anomaly and was one of the only countries who was able to achieve this feat. Surrounded by mixed race countries, Argentina developed this Eurocentric homogenous white nation narrative towards European modernity, thereby diminishing any sort of ethno racial diversity within it. This, then, is why maybe you have not seen this narrative, as these silences have been policed and reinforced in public discourse and everyday life. For example, according to the former Argentinian president in South America, we are all European descendants thereby strengthening Argentina's strong bonds and natural association with Europe. With Argentinian leaders like these holding such strong ties with Europe, delicately constructed narratives centering whiteness as what it means to be Argentinian are thereby formed, leading to the denial of the lived experiences of Black, Indigenous, and other marginalized folks. So, who are these left out, silenced, forgotten about? According to a census in 2010, out of 40 million people, 950,032 people self-identify as descended from or belonging to an indigenous people. In some provinces, indigenous population accounts for 17 to 25 percent of the population. This includes tribes such as the Mapuche, Toba, Huichi, Tupi, Guarani, Huarpe, and the Koya people. Today, we will focus on the Koya people and center our question on how these people formulate their own ethnic identity with observance to Argentina's national narrative rooted in colonialism. But first, hold up. Before we get to identity construction, who are the Koya people? Well, the Koya people live across three different countries, Western Bolivia, Chile, and Western Argentina, with various subgroups as well, including the Omaguaca, Zenta, and Hispira. And according to a census count in 1996, they make up 170,000 of Argentina's population. However, for the sake of this video and your travel plans to Argentina, we will only be focusing upon the northwestern highlands of Argentina, within the provinces of Jujuy and Salta. Koya people in Argentina live in yungas or high altitude forests, and most are agriculturalists and herders. So, now back to our original question, how is identity constructed within this group of indigenous people? But wait, what even is identity? Who can define this? According to Lori Ojipinti, indigenous cultures have become simplified and folklorized to make it easier for outsiders to understand, and this includes the Koya people. But in reality, identity is intensely local and individual, it fluctuates, and there's really no clear understanding of what it's like to be Koya or even, more broadly, indigenous. This impermanence stems from the same transient type of culture that is born within these con communities, such as the Koya. Just like there are many different ways to express identity, there are numerous ways to express one's culture within more fluid boundaries. The way the Koya people interpret their own identity and culture is an active process, no means static, as they constantly adjust to the new technological advancements and movements within Argentina. As stated before, there are so many Koya people, each drawing from unique backgrounds and locations in South America, and even within Argentina, each different location and a person will tell you a varied answer of what it means to be Koya for them based upon their own lived experience. For example, in the Iturbe community, a place that is more touristy and has more access to technology, the Koya are more conscious and more activist in their own base of Koya identity. Whereas in the Aruyan community, where, which is more in isolation, they are more proud of their national identity. As stated before, identity formation is intensely local, varying not only to community to community, but moreover, person to person. One son said his father was proud to be Koya, whereas others, in their 50s or 60s, felt as if the term marked a lesser status. Some even are unwilling to be associated with Koya people as a specific group, due to the fraught past of oppression of indigenous people through colonialism, or the strong linkage with being poor farmers. Others are amidst the reclamation process, rediscovering how Koya fits into their framework of their own personality. And, in addition, even if one has reclaimed their identity, it does not mean necessarily that they feel the same way about their indigenous identity. In fact, indigenous identity is a whole other concept in and of itself, as the tribes themselves, as well as outsiders in general, view various indigenous groups differently than one another. The public eye coins the people of the Puna, High Plains, as somehow less indigenous than the people of the Valles, valleys, such as the Chaco, Huichi, or the Mapuche, who are somehow given the unquestioned assumption of being truly indigenous. Within the valley, there is greater acceptance of indigenous identity, creating little ambivalence or doubt about their own identity.
Teresa Apulef, an indigenous woman from the Mapuche tribe, testifies that although the Mapuche suffered a lot, now it is different. The Mapuche are respected. I have many good relations with white people, and I appreciate them a lot. Even though they see me as Mapuche, I am loved and respected. Whereas the Koya and other high plain tribes must fight to reify their own indigeneity and status of being Koya. So now, back to the question proposed at the beginning, what are the factors that make ethnic identity vary so much within the Koya community and within the individuals themselves? Well, to make it easier to understand, we're going to divide it into three different categories, national history, land relations, and religious ties. And to make it even easier to remember, all of these are linked together, sharing the same common denominator, which is colonialism. So let's start with understanding the Koya's history with colonial authority from Europe. Let's bring it back almost 500 years ago when this region first had contact with the Spaniards. In 1540, the Omaguaca, Zenta, and Hispira people had already settled in the Yungas of Argentina when the conquerors arrived. Then, after 110 years of attempting to block the Spanish invasion, the Coya lost part of their land, the Santiago Estate. And even after Argentina, the country itself, gained independence in 1816, the Coya people were still at the mercy of the foreign owners, whether it be private or public, of the Santiago Estate. Furthermore, this marking of freedom only increased the isolation and peripheral status of communities in the Northwest. The Koya people were viewed as cheap, used and manipulated by the love of their land. But finally, on March 19, 1997, the Koya people took legal ownership over the estate. Unfortunately, however, this fraught history with the Spanish colonialism still seeps into the present, as it foregrounds how Koya people view their own identity in relation to this past that they must grapple with. And although the Koya people just recently in 1994 are recognized for their presence within Argentinian society, the government in reality still fails to take seriously these rights in any practical sense, as they still have a patriarchal dismissive attitude towards the indigenous population. Example, the Argentinian government used to call the Koya people Koya or Koya. That came with a derogatory connotation, denoting that they were somehow more inferior, rural, barbaric, and even slow to react. This category also grouped the Koyas with those in Bolivia, thereby denying the differences in locale and identities that come with it. Just recently, have the Koya people have begun to reclaim their power and respectability as the Koya, not as the Koya. With this name comes a subtle critique and pushback against colonial prejudice and inferiority, transforming and making visible the politics, culture, and local indigeneity of northern Argentina. So, as you can see, even though the colonial period happened almost 500 years ago, colonialism itself still infiltrates itself throughout society, shaping the way Koya people view their own spelling of their name, a journey as a whole, and the physical land itself. That leads us to our second topic, land relations. How do Koya connect themselves and form an identity with the surrounding rural landscape? How does this relationship take on highly politicized dimensions within the turning age? And finally, how does it shift based upon various gendered individuals? Well, to begin with, the Koya identity has always been inextricably linked with the earth itself, shaping the way they see the world around them. The Koya people are agriculturalists and rely heavily on subsistence farming, automatically tying some part of their formation of identity to their connection with the rural areas of the Puna region. So, when the time came when the Koya had to defend their land rights in cases and protests against the government, some emphasized their rural worker and marginalized minority status to request and win specific territory. These decisions shaped and redefined for the Koya people what is truly meant to be Koya and how that related to their ethnic identity in comparison. Some even viewed their Koya identity as a site of resistance, thereby alienating any members of the Koya people when they decided to leave their home from La Puna to move to the city. Those individuals to have forgotten their Koya identity as it is so inextricably grounded to the land, culture, and politics around them. However, some who have decided to leave for extended periods of time, such as Maria in documentary Koya in Argentina, have seemingly strengthened their own identity. Maria has found her voice through working with NGOs such as the Red Puna Corporation, subtly subverting the gender roles within her own organization. The land and this organization gives her purpose and drive. Previously, absent from the narrative, Koya indigenous women have begun to reclaim their position within society, fighting for land rights alongside other Koya men in organizations such as the Senko, the Centro Koya instead of being seen as just reproductions of their own home. And finally, Koya women are seen as creatures who are deeply connected to the earth, La Pachamama, who are one with nature themselves. But wait, what is Pachamama? This leads us to our third and final topic of how the Koya ethnic identity forms, religious ties. Before the Spaniards even tried to invade the Koya people back in 1540, traditions and celebrations of the Koya were a central figure in their lives. From La Senyalada, a family celebration, to La Chayada, process to wish good omens, to Gantos, singing within the summer and winter, to La Pachamama, giving food to the earth, the relationship to land is one of sacrifice and suffering and is tightly bonded with all the practiced traditions aligning with the traditional Koya calendar. These celebrations and religious ties within the land automatically help comprise elements of how the Koya people shape their identity.
But of course, as said before, colonialism does undergird all aspects of Koya life and the formation of ethnic identity. It is integral to recognize the role religion from Spain and Christianity played within influencing the Koya people. And according to Lori Ochipinti, the Catholic Church did play an active role in promoting both the land claim itself and Koya identity and customs. In fact, she even says that the church has emphasized emotional and cultural tie to land. Rosario Quispe, a Koya woman, states in her testimonial, I'm grateful for our God, but also La Pachamama, Mother Earth. Whereas Natalia Sarapura is not as aligned with the church as Rosario. She states in her testimonial that she chose to give her daughter an indigenous name and did not want her baptized to the church, but rather through indigenous traditions. These various lived experiences from these Koya women show us the importance of recognizing both aspects of religion and the ways worldly visions converge and manifest through different perspectives of the land, values, and identity. So, as you can see, there are many different avenues to initially approach understanding how ethnic identity is created within the Koya people. National history, land relations, and religious ties, we can see how they are all grounded in colonialism, but play different roles in shaping one's fluid, local, fluctuating individual identity. So, you're still going to Argentina, your flight is booked, your itinerary is still empty. How will you let this video define your travels?